All right, here we go. Lord Jamar, welcome back. V Lad, what's good? Oh, a lot of things are good. Yeah. A whole lot of things are good in the world right now. Okay. And we have a lot of topics to cover, but we have to talk about the elephant in the room first. Oh. <laughs> now, now, now. God damn it. Let the record reflect. Whatever we're about to talk about, you're bringing this up. Not My me. Idea. My idea. This is all me. Blame, blame the media guy. I'm good with that. Right. Okay. So to just kind of give the overall story. Back in 2013, you and I started a conversation about white rappers in general being guests in the house of hip hop. Yes, we did. Over time, over the next was a year harmless. or so. <laughs> I thought it was a harmless conversation, but go ahead. And before we even started doing interviews, I had an interview from before saying I felt like a guest in the House of Hip Hop, and I'm Which very I happy no to be a guest. I had no idea about, never heard of, found that after the fact. But anyway, go ahead. Right. So once you started that narrative, I agreed with it. Over time, Eminem became part of that conversation as a guest in the House of Hip Hop. Well, no, a, a, a how he became a part of the conversation is you said Eminem too. And I'm like, yeah, Eminem too. Like all of them, Eminem, Beastie Boys, Rick Rubin, all of them. All of them, all of them. And over time, many rappers have kind of chimed in on this topic, like Schoolboy Q, um, uh, Feral Monch from Organized Confusion, uh, Royce the Five Nine, lots of different people. Yellow Wolf, the list goes on and on. Because a lot of times in my interviews, I would incorporate this question and get a an interesting answer. So this yeah, kind of kept point, going. Was incorporating it a little too much, but whatever. Go ahead. <laughs> whatever. <laughs> so then, to just kind of speed along this part, uh, Eminem dropped Kamikaze. And he responded to you about being a guest in the house of hip hop and saying, I belong here, clown, and, you know, start naming all the people that he brought in, like 50 Cent and, and so forth. And then in his new album, he responded to you again. And he said that if hip hop was a house, then really G Rap and Rakim would have you mopping floors and so forth. Mm -hmm. And everyone pretty much thought that was the end of that. Well, then Until, he also went over to Abu Dhabi and, and got on the right. mic and said some shit about me in between those two things. It, in, in between, exactly. Uh, although he didn't really address the House of Hip Hop in that particular... No, uh, but he just addressed his disdain for Lord dis Jamar. Disdain for yeah. Lord Jamar. Uh -huh. So, just recently, a friend of mine, Crooked Eye, who's collaborated with Eminem a lot, in Slaughterhouse, as well as on Eminem solo projects, uh, did a, an interview with Eminem. And in the interview, he asked how Eminem feels about white rappers being a guest in the house of hip hop. So Eminem responded. He said, with the whole beef of a certain person, right. meaning... You. you were quick to say my name on a diss track, but now when you admit this shit, you don't want to say my name. But go ahead. He said, I never said I wasn't a guest. I'm absolutely a guest. Right. And there you have it, seven years later. Right. So why, why were we going through this in the first place? You never said you weren't, but you never said you were until now. Like, like... <laughs> This could have been ended a long time ago. Like, 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 not that it's even anything like, like, I don't even feel like, you know, like he even used the word beef in there. Like, this was no beef. Like, this was just me stating my fucking opinion and a bunch of fucking stands having a problem with it. And then them, you know, amplifying some shit so much back to him that he had to respond. Like, like really the stands I feel are responsible for a lot of this fucking back and forth shit. Like, you know what I mean? I hear the shit that they say to me. He hears the shit that they say to him. And 
it just fucking conflates the whole fucking shit. You know what I mean? But at the end of the day, this was no real beef or whatever. And and, and all my points were proven. You know what I mean? Um, I don't take this as any personal victory or anything like this. This is actually, you know, I said this on my show. This just speaks to the power of the soil. Okay? I represent the voice of the soil of hip-hop. Meaning, you know, you can plant many seeds in the soil, but the soil decides what grows. Okay? It's not the seed that decides. It's the soil that decides. When they try to plant the seed of, of um, wearing skirts in hip-hop, which was the controversial thing before the guest in the House of Hip-Hop thing, I, as one of the representatives of the soil, said, absolutely not. We're not going to allow that to grow. Get that the fuck out of here. And what happened? We're not wearing skirts right now. Right. And that's actually how the Lord Jamar Vlad TV relationship started. It was with an interview back in 2013. Right. About Kanye wearing a skirt. Right. And Which was a of, one and done. Right. And <laughs> he wore of, it once and then he never wore it again. Right. And, and, and it was done immediately. Not only did he stop wearing skirts after that, he, he requested that, um, what's that big uh, photo site that you... Um, Getty, Getty, Getty Images? He request, requested that Getty Images take down all images of him in a skirt, okay? Never once did he dislaw Jamar, but we know he heard me, okay? Because I had conversations with close people to him and all of that type of shit during that time. Really? Okay, I didn't know about this part. So oh. what were the... What was the feedback that you were getting back from Kanye through someone else? Well, I didn't have a, a direct Kanye feedback, but I was talking to close people like Rhyme Fest, people like that, you know, just basically stating my opinion. And, and after talking with grown men, you know, it was understand, it was understood. And we went away from it. But I know that those people are close enough to him to go back and tell him what I said and blah, 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 blah. You know what I mean? And he never came out of his face, yo, fuck Lord Jamar, you know, he's a nobody and all this other shit. He just took the shit and probably reflected and was like, you know what, he's right. You know what I mean? He is one of these soil, speaking for the soil type motherfuckers. That's what people like about me because I say the shit that a lot of people will not fucking say. And that's representative of how the soil of, of this culture feels, okay? So we're not going to always go with the, you know, the politically correct shit. That comes from other places, you know what I mean? When we talk about the soil of hip-hop, that's why I said we're the ones who decide who the goats are, you know what I mean? Not record sales, not how fast you could rap. Or the soil will decide if you are the goat. That's all my shit was. It was never a personal thing against Eminem. If anything, it's a fuck you to, you know, white supremacy. You know, to the fact that you think you could come in here and dictate all genres of everything. Like, and we're saying as the soil, no, you can't. Right, because he also went on to address the whole king of hip hop. First of all, I never said statement. king. I never used the word king. I said goat. Okay? Right. But he basically said, I don't consider myself the king Good. of hip-hop. You know, who is the king of hip-hop? You can't even really classify that. And he, he went on to talk about how there was a certain song that he got with a chorus in it that kind of inferred he was the king, and he had the producer change that around because he didn't want that. Right, but then out. why did you release Rap God? Hmm? Yeah. You know, because for us, you know, the God MC is Rakim. So to make a song called Rap God and then to have your stand still to this day, hashtag Eminem's the GOAT, Rap God, and all that type of shit, it instigates certain things. You understand what I'm saying? And again, I feel like it's a lot of these fucking stands. Like, I can't front. Like, I've come across different people's fans and a lot of the, you know, a lot of the fanatics are very fucking annoying. But this guy's fucking fans are... They're on some next level shit. Like, you know what I mean? They're really fucking <laughs> annoying as fuck. <laughs> um, and I think they exacerbate the whole situation. You know what I mean? 
Um, of course. This was course. never personal. Again, this was never personal. But he admitted it. So then what was the whole thing about? Like, why was we, why was this even a thing? If you always knew that you was a guest, then why from the beginning couldn't just say, Lord Jamar's right. Leave him alone. I am a guest in this shit. I don't think I'm the, the, the goat, the king, whatever moniker you want to call. Why did we why did it take this long? You said it we said it's when? 2013? 2013. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's wow. Yeah. Well, shout out to Crooked Eye for pushing the envelope and asking a tough question. Yes. During during his interview with Eminem. Right. Ultimately, someone on the caliber of Eminem could have stopped the interview and said, that's it. Or, you know, we're going to take that part out. Well, you think he didn't but, know that that question wasn't coming? You don't think that, just like you said, let's keep it real. You you put out a tweet and was like, yo, Eminem, why don't you come on Vlad TV so that you'll have, you know, someone to interview you that's not on your payroll that, you know, doesn't have any business dealing with you and can really throw you those hardball questions. Well, but... Crooked Eye does have business dealings with Eminem. Exactly. That's why he so. did the interview with him. <laughs> and, and so what I'm saying is, since he does have business dealings with him, you think the dude Eminem didn't say, yo, let me, I want to know the questions that you're going to ask me ahead of time. Do I ever, do I ever know what questions you're going to ask me before you come, before I come here? Never. 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 This is all Never. just off the head, train of thought type of shit. Because I don't give, because I don't give a fuck. I know how to think on my feet. I don't have to know the shit ahead of time or whatever. But I guarantee you that question was already known. So there was no walking out. That's why he answered it the way he did. He he had a uh he had a a, a response already in play. But I, what I will say is, you know, <laughs> like I just want to clarify cuz sometimes like people will apologize for something. Not that he's apologizing, but Sometimes you'd be like, what are you apologizing for? Like, do you really even know? So you say you're a guest. A guest in what? Can we just can we just clarify that again? You're a guest in the house of hip hop that black people built. Let's just can you say that? <laughs> like out your mouth fully? Because it's I think almost pretty much it's I, almost I think skirting pretty much a said. little shit in a way too though. Uh, but whatever. No, I'm, I, I'm gonna give it to him. Uh, I am gonna give it to I him think, too. I'll take I think it. he yeah, I think he fully addressed it, and honestly, I respect Eminem for humbling himself because I do too. He did not have to do that. He could have either kept on his position, say, "Yo, no, I'm not a guest. Here's all the things I've done," and just went down a laundry list of the things that would support his position, or he could have just said, "We're gonna cut that question out." Next question. Well, yes, I get. You know, there's there's degrees to everything. You know. I guess I was looking for the most humble. <laughs> but that was a form of humility. And listen, we'll take it. Hopefully this shit is, is, is over. We don't have to keep talking about him because all his people swear that the only thing I ever talk about is him. And, you know, we have how many interviews that can prove that otherwise? Like, <laughs> like there was times when... There was full Eminem shit going on, and we didn't even speak his name at all. Like, uh, well, yeah. I mean, people think that all I do is talk about Eminem on Vlad TV, but I did a quick search. I mean, less than one percent of my interviews cover Eminem. Less than one percent. This is what I'm saying. And again, it's the stand. Like, these are the motherfuckers that this is all they pay attention to. So they feel like every time this dude's talking, he's always saying his name. Like, for instance, you and I are doing the um. You know, we're doing a thing together at Sony Hall on April 5th. Vlad TV, you know what I mean? Godcast, Lord Jamal, DJ Vlad. Um, people swear that <laughs> if you, you know, some people will come to, at the comments when I posted the flyer. And, oh, all y'all gonna do is talk about Eminem the whole time. Like, come on, give me a fucking break. Like, we tired of talking about this dude. Like, hopefully this shit is put to rest. Now that he said it, See, he's their Lord and Savior. So if your Lord and Savior says it, if your Lord and Savior says that he's a guest, then all y'all motherfuckers is a guest. Case closed. <laughs> it's done. 
So let's stop talking about it moving on. But they still hit me. No, you're the guest. Da 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 da. Blah blah blah. All right, all right, all right. Whatever. <laughs> yep, and there'll be a link below to actually purchase tickets to this event. That's what's uh, up. April fifth at Sony Hall in New York City. Uh, Lord Jamar and DJ Vlad doing our thing on stage, having a one of our typical interviews, but with in front of a big audience. And people will be able to see you. Yep. You're not going to yep. hide behind a curtain on some Wizard of no, Oz no shit. No curtains. You're going to be right no there. Curtains. And we'll film it. The whole thing will be filmed. I'll be on right, camera this Right, properly, time. like we should have did the other time. Like we should have done now. last time. Yeah, we had another one where I wasn't on camera. This right, time, we'll, we'll be on this camera. This time, yeah, we're going to do it right. <laughs> that's right. All right, so let's go ahead and get into everything else that's going on. All right. The Kobe Memorial. Oh. Well, I didn't see the whole thing. I didn't see, I see pieces of it. Yeah, I watched a few pieces also. Very sad day. Uh, very sad day in L.A. Very sad day for sports fans everywhere. I think uh, the highlight of that memorial, if, if you could say highlight in a sad situation like that, was Michael Jordan coming on stage mm. and speaking about Kobe. And he was crying as he was speaking about him. Did you see this or no? No, I didn't. Oh, you, oh, you didn't see this? Okay, so I'll, I'm going to explain to you what happened. So he's talking about how much he loved Kobe and how important Kobe was to basketball, and he's crying as he's doing it. And near the end, he goes, and you know, now I'm going to have to have another another meme of my face for the next two years crying after this. <laughs> and. Yeah. The whole Staples Center kind of laughed. Because that is at the oh, same so that time. is Jordan with the with with that face that's in the meme. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And now we say there's gonna be another crying Jordan meme because of this, and uh, it just brought a sense of humor to a very very sad situation. Well, well, the one that I saw that gave me a fucking chuckle, okay, is when Shaq <laughs> was up there and he said, "Hey, hey, uh, Kobe." You know there's no I in team. He said, Kobe said to him, yeah, but there's an M.E. in that motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody started laughing. I missed that and one. Then, and, then, and, then, and then he said, uh, Shaq said he went over to the, to the other players. He was like, yeah, he not going to pass us the ball. <laughs> He was trying to get him to pass the ball. And was, yeah, there's no I and T. Hey, there's an ME in that motherfucker. Oh, yeah, he's not going to pass us the ball. Yeah. Um, I tried. I tried. That was funny. Uh, oh, as oh fuck. yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I, the, like, the I, like, I like moments like that at a funeral. Like, you know what I mean? Like, when, when you can laugh and cry and mix the, you know, because, yeah. you know, they're, 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 they're emotions that are like, Polar opposites, but they're on the same wavelength almost. You know what I mean? Laughter and crying. Yeah, and for Jordan to actually get up and do a speech because they competed against each other even after Jordan retired. Mm. Like, there was a story. I remember I had John Sally come in right after Kobe's death because you know Sally knew him and he played with him. And we talked about this situation where, uh, you know, Jordan was kind of on his way out. And, and keep in mind that Kobe joined the NBA straight out of high school so right, he could to play, play against Mike, against Jordan, so people could say that he's the best. They wouldn't say, well, you never played against him, so you never know. Right. So near the end of Jordan's career, they played together and. Near the end of the game, Jordan goes, you can wear my shoes, but you'll never fill them. Jordan beats Kobe. At the end of the game, he smacks Kobe on the butt and said, you can put the shoes on, but you'll never fill them. Kobe stopped talking to his teammates for two weeks. Literally would not say anything to anybody. And when they, they talked to Phil Jackson, the teammates were like, what's, what's going on? What's going on? He's like, so Phil's like, ah, well, Jordan told him that comment, and it, it upset him. So they already knew what was, what was coming. So then the Wizards came to Los Angeles to play. 
Kobe scored 42 points in the first half <laughs> and scored 55 points in that game on Jordan. Kobe Bryant really wanted to be number one. He didn't want to be one of the best. Right. He didn't want then, to be, you know, in a small group of the all. No, he wanted to be the number one guy of all time. Right, but then you'll always have people that'll say this person in their prime and then this one in there. So he could have scored a 1,000 points in that game. It, you're always going to have some, yeah, but Jordan, uh, Jordan was on his way out. He wasn't in his prime. He would have never did that to Jordan in his prime. Um, and we'll never know that. You know what I mean? So, yeah. It is what it is, man. Two great players at the end of time, uh, at the end of the day, one losing his life. In way too early. His life, way too early while he was still young and still looked like the Kobe that we all watched on television. Yes, yeah, still looked like uh, that Kobe. Still looked like that same Kobe. Um, very, very sad, man. Did and we even see a gray hair come to this man's head? No. No, no gray hairs. No, no. Well, I mean, he was cut pretty low, but still. Still, that should be coming out. Still. Like. Yeah. <laughs> Kobe's parents were at the funeral at the memorial, but neither one of them got on stage to speak. Now, I was reading some little things here and there where people were acting like his parents might have been disrespected in some sort of way, like they weren't acknowledged and so, I don't know. Like, this is the little, like, chirpings that I'm hearing here and there in so social media and shit like that. Do you know anything about this? Well, Kobe's parents weren't in his life for a very long time. In mm. fact, they, they were against him marrying Vanessa. They didn't go to the wedding. Oh, really? I didn't know all yeah. of this. Yeah, and then, and they've pretty much been, have been excommunicated uh, the whole time, from what I understand. There was even some stuff that happened where they were selling some of his memorabilia because he wasn't really financially supporting them and so forth. Not really? that he has to. Not that he has to. These are two grown people. Uh, but there but was you a should. split, and I think... The people that brought you into this goddamn world... Right. Gave you your, think, your, your talents... Didn't his yeah. pops train him in all that in basketball and all that type of shit? Well, his his dad was a professional uh, basketball player. So where you think these these gifts come from? You can't, you know what I mean? Uh, that's a whole nother conversation, but <laughs> yeah. I don't know the whole dynamics of it, but, you know, you got to respect your parents, man. I would have really liked to see Kobe's father speak at his funeral. I think that would have been very poignant. And I think that everyone would have really too? appreciated it. And his mother, too. Did his sister speak? I don't think so. I think this was just a celebrity thing. Really? Yeah. They actually charged for admission. It was like tickets for like 200 something dollars. Wow. Yeah, th there, there were some things that kind of went on what does that money go towards? I don't know. Maybe to cover the cost of the Staples Center. But then again, Nipsey, when he got buried... You know, when he had his memorial at Staples Center, it was free. When Michael Jackson had his memorial, it was free. Hmm. There are costs associated with this, but usually if Nipsey somebody could pay eats for it, it. Yeah, somebody eats those costs in order to. Yeah, I mean, Kobe's estate is worth hundreds of millions of dollars. This so... is what I'm saying. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. Hmm. Uh, I don't know. There, there was a few moves that were done around that that I don't fully agree with. But then again, I'm not the family, so who am I to say anything? Right. And who knows if you're thinking clearly at a time like this. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, I yeah. whether you're even handling this part. Like, right. This could just, have been somebody, yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, because, you know, um, Vanessa is suing the helicopter company. Yes. Which I'm sure all the other people are going to also. Right. Uh, you know, it's, it's going to be... Uh, a clusterfuck of legal fees and lawsuits and bankruptcies and, and all types of other shit before the dust settles. It'll probably take 10 or 20 years mm. before all this is all done. It's not going to be done in a year or two. Um, yeah, very, very sad situation. But before, before the memorial, Gail King did an interview with Lisa Leslie and she brought up whether she thinks that the rape allegations would tarnish Kobe's legacy. And all hell broke loose afterwards. Yes, it did. What did you think of that? 
What did I think of her asking that question at that time? Yes. I mean, you know, as a, as a human being and all of that, it seemed very insensitive. Um, you know, disrespectful. Um, it just felt wrong. It just yeah. felt wrong. Um, but now from the journalism side, from a, from a reporter's standpoint, I don't know. I don't know if you have to ask that question. <sighs> well, I'm a, I'm a journalist and I do what Gail King does. We essentially have the same job. We have different platforms, but the mechanics of the job is essentially the same. I sit down with people and I interview them for a living. Right. <sighs> what, what she did was extremely intentional. It was not taken out of context like she claimed afterwards. Right. The fact that it was part of a bigger interview really doesn't matter because as you're doing an interview, people who have been doing it for a while, you understand how to squeeze in certain questions and how to set up things and how to have leading questions to, to lead into a topic that you want to cover. When I interviewed John Sally, Kobe's rape allegations were brought up in that interview by him, but it was done in a very respectful manner, and it was touched upon without blame or saying, is this gonna tarnish his legacy or whatever else. You can bring these things up and you can address them as a journalist. But the way it was done, I think was just kind of rotten, which right. is what how everyone saw it. Right, and so you gotta also understand at her level, see, when you ask your questions at Vlad TV, these are basically Vlad asking these questions. You don't necessarily have like a team of producers behind you who's giving you questions as well. Like like Um well my my executive assistant helps out with my questions. I have a I have at least you know one person if not more that contribute to these questions. Right, but at the end of the day, you're the one that decides what's going to get asked and all of that. Like when you're at as, a level of as does as does Gail King. When you're at that CBS level and the kind of money she's making, no, no, no. Somebody's going to fucking tell you at certain times what you're going to ask and what you're not going to ask. Mm, Trust me. You don't get I don't know. Trust me. I I I don't the I don't boss know. Is I I see like, I see where you're make going. Make sure you fucking ask that question. I don't really she might have uh Autonomy in whole other places, but in certain times, I'm telling you that she's getting that fucking call from the from the top office, the one that pays her check. You gonna answer that? You gonna ask that question, whether you like it or not? Yes, sir. Well, trust me. I looked. I looked up Gail King's salary, and it's five point five million. You don't get paid that much and think you're gonna do whatever the fuck you want to do. At five point five million, you do whatever the fuck they question. tell you to do. Yeah, there's that. Well, ultimately, you don't have to take that job if you have. No. If there's a question that you don't want to. But it's our. She's already in it. So now it's like, are you going to quit over that? Or are you going to quit over at having to ask that question? No, she's not ready to do that. She's not people, ready. To people do that. have quit. Like, you know. Nick Cannon had a whole thing with uh, America's Got Talent where he ended up quitting based on the treatment that he got from that company. Right. And everyone, he walked away from like a $10 million a year check. Right, but not everybody More, he, has, he actually had a bigger check than Gail, to, to be honest. Not everybody has that, those type of ethics and morals and will stand by certain shit like that. And, and no, listen, I already got money. If I walk away from this, it's not like I'm going to be fucking destitute. You've been making five million dollars a year for how many years? If you walked right. away now, are you gonna be fucked up? Like, come on, somebody else would 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 hire Gail King or whatever. So you do have the power to be like, no, I'm not gonna do that, and I'll fucking I'll walk. You know what I mean? But you got a lot of people like, oh hell no, I'm not doing that. Like this is my shit. Like I worked too hard to get here, and da 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 da. And they need me to do scumbag moves, then I'm gonna do scumbag moves. <laughs> it's just what it is, you know. Well, uh, the person that was the most outraged was Snoop Dogg. Yes. He called her a funky doghead bitch. Yes. He said, how dare you want to tarnish my homeboy's reputation? Respect the family and back off, bitch, before we come get you. Yeah. 
And now everybody got on Snoop for saying that. Everyone got on Snoop. Well, I don't, uh, I don't know. Not, everybody not in the mainstream media, I guess, did. Right. Well, Bill Cosby actually supported Snoop on this stance. Right. <laughs> he chimed in. He said, you know, through his publicist, I guess, but on his official Instagram page. He said, yeah, you funky dog head, bitch. <laughs> he said, it's so sad and disappointing that successful black women are being used to tar tarnish the image and legacy of successful black men, even in death. My heartfelt prayers are with Kobe and his family, as well as with Michael Jackson and his family. May their legacies live on forever. Mm. Okay. I mean... He brought, he brought Michael Jackson into the conversation. Right. Because look, look, look what they were connected with. And now, with the conviction of Harvey Weinstein, you know, I, I'm sure that Gail is behind the scenes preparing for the surviving Harvey Weinstein story, right? That's coming, right? Gotta be. Because y'all motherfuckers went so hard on the black men, now you got an actual somebody who's convicted of this shit. Like, they made stories about people that weren't even convicted. They were accused. Now this motherfucker's convicted. Where's his story? Where's Epstein's story? Well, Harvey Weinstein was convicted of a criminal sex act in the first degree. And third degree. Two rape, counts of third rape, degree rape. Yeah, rape in the third degree. Yep. He was acquitted on three other charges. Yep. Uh, one of the most amusing parts of this trial was Harvey would use a walker to go to trial every day. But after he was convicted, you see him walk out without the walker. <laughs> like, fuck I this feel shit. like this is the new <laughs> shit that rich people do. Like, I mean, I'm not going to front. I feel like Cosby was the first one to do it, though. Cosby, all of a sudden, when he went to trial, all of a sudden, this, uh, uh, I can't, I can't see. Uh, 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 let me, let me grab the back of your jacket, and then, and then the next one to do it after him was Suge. Like, oh, Suge shit. Knight. You know what? That that Cosby. I don't know. Let me, let me look like I'm getting broke down now. Let me look like, you know. And then here goes uh, <laughs> this nigga Weinstein coming in the motherfucking court. Like he all frail and fucked up trying to get some sort of sympathy. But guess what? Like like you got poor people that'll show up to court with, with fucking amputated legs and shit like that and still get the fucking full sentence and all. They don't give a fuck about that. Like like you got fucking 80, you know, you, somebody that might be 80 years old. That was involved in a, in a in a hood drug ring or some shit. They was selling crack out of their house or some shit. They gonna get this motherfucker the full, beat him with the full extent of the law. Make sure they die in prison. But these motherfuckers acting off. <laughs> Could you? And, and he's not in jail yet. He's still in in, uh, in the hospital, I think. Yeah, he went straight to the hospital afterwards because he had some complications with the right. back oh, surgery his heart. or something like yeah. that. You know how many niggas' heart be beating after they get sentenced <laughs> for life? They can't go to the hospital for that shit. Are you crazy? Yo, he's still there. Like, yo, I, I don't feel good. Like, get the fuck out of here. Put that man in gem pop. Make him join the bloods or some shit. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Bill Cosby chimed in on this one as well. He said, here's the question that should haunt all Americans, especially wealthy and famous men. Where do we go in this country to find fairness and impartiality in the judicial system? And that's real talk. Because let's, let's analyze this case a little bit. Not that I'm some Harvey Weinstein. You know, I, I, he probably was a piece of shit. He probably was a scumbag. But... This case represents a very slippery slope. Here's why. The things he was convicted of were allegations from women that uh, accused him of something, but then had relationships with him after the so-called what they accused him of. See, right. in the past, it would be hard to bring charges on something like that because you'd be like, well, why was you still fucking with him afterwards? You know what I mean? Like, if he did this to you, why was you still fucking with him? So it's funny that the accusers 
like that that claimed he did something but still have they still got some of them one of them even texted him talking about I love you and shit like that after the fact they believe those women but Annabella Schiori who claimed that this guy raped her but she didn't fuck with him after that they didn't believe her hers was the first degree rape so they didn't believe her but they believed the other ones now what's so dangerous is about that is that how many women could, could, after the fact, be like, you know what? You know, this guy did something to me a while ago. And even though I continued to see him for a while thereafter, you know, I could just say that he did something to me prior to that. And, and, and y'all just forget about the fact that I kept going to see him. You got all these texts of me talking about what up, where you at? I don't want some of that dick, all of it. You, know, you forget about all of that shit. And now you could be convicted just because this woman said some shit. Like, that's dangerous. That's dangerous. All right. And a, and a good enough lawyer could actually get some of those, all the future communications thrown out of evidence where the jury won't even see it. Right. It's a, man, I've said this before. This is a country that's run by lawyers. That's who's really making the rules. Most of the politicians have law backgrounds. We're lawyers at one point. Hmm. All the judges were lawyers. Right. Right? And, like, whoever the lawyer was that managed to get a, a verdict for emotional distress, he set off a, a chain of events and trillions of dollars that could never be proven or disproven. Think about that. Jamar, when you did these things to me, I had so much emotional distress. It made me so sad that I need $10 million to repair that. Well, can you prove your emotional distress? No, I cannot because it all happened in my head. Right. But I can tell you I was really sad during that time. And I deserve to be compensated for that. Yep. D did your arm get broken? No, no. No harm was done to my body. Well, did he steal a car or, you know, uh, swipe your, your watch? Nope, nope, none of that. Nope, no, nope, nothing but, was harmed. But I'll, I'll tell you what did happen. I usually eat Chips Ahoy every night, and I haven't eaten Chips Ahoy in months. <laughs> months. Because of this. <laughs> because of this. Pay me. Pay me. <laughs> and a lot of times... Judges will, will say, well, in order to prove the emotional distress, you have to have seen a therapist and stuff like that. Uh, but even that is very gray area. That's not always required in every trial. Or you can go see a therapist and just tell him how sad you are, and he'll write down that you were sad, and that's the end of that. Once or they again, don't have to tell any... First of all, they don't have to... Con I think just going to the therapist. The therapist is not supposed to reveal what you say to them. Right. Right? So right, you're right. All so you do so really I have a have history of going to a record of going there. Just right. like when and, you, you know, get while I'm there, I'm talking about problems with my parents. But then again, but you know, he can't say that. So therefore, you have a long history of uh, of when medical you get in care accident, to a therapist. When you get in an accident and you try to sue and all that, they want to see that you've been going to the therapist and all this type of shit. You know what I mean? That's part of your case. Like like, and so if you've been going, then they'll just assume that oh well, he really is fucking. You know what I mean? Something yep. must be wrong because he kept going to the therapist. Right. Even if you didn't get and, a surgery or nothing. <laughs> exactly. You know, and what I think, honestly, is the most ridiculous one out of the bunch here. A woman is suing Rick James for rape that happened 40 years ago. And he's dead. He's been dead for 10 years. <laughs> this happened... For a rape forty years ago. Now and, and wait, and, but but she's suing his estate right now. Correct, correct. For uh, how much is she suing for? Hold on a second. Oh, here we go. She's suing for fifty million dollars because she claims that uh, some group home when she was fifteen, he came to visit and he raped her in nineteen seventy nine. He raped her in a group home in 1979, and she didn't bring it up 
until he was dead, 10 years after he was dead. Yeah. Until there were no flesh on his bones. He's completely, <laughs> completely combined with the dirt at this point. And, we and now just, she wants to go. And we got to just take her word for it? Like, I don't know. Apparently, maybe she had someone else there that she may have confided with. Uh, and let's just be fair. Rick James went to prison for tying up a woman and making her smoke crack and, and raping her and stuff like that. So... So we're not going to say that and, Rick James... And I also got to put out there, you know, because, you know, my female co-host, Rod Digger, you know, wants want me to know that just because a woman might have dealt with someone afterwards, after something that happened, doesn't mean that nothing happened. You understand what I'm saying? Like, it is possible for, you know, someone to be abused i guess and then still see a person afterwards or something you know maybe some sort of a stockholm syndrome type of deal i don't know but that's just what i was you know i was told yeah by, i mean by my, yeah i think that's female. a valid yeah i think that, that that is a valid statement you could potentially deal with someone afterwards but i think it very much weakens your stance Absolutely. On that on that particular issue, absolutely. Because if it really was that bad, why would you even want to see that person ever again? And I think it it it, it opens it definitely opens your story up to holes and can create a reasonable doubt, which is what's supposed to be you know able to get somebody off in 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 trials and shit like that, right? Like if there's a reasonable doubt. Is introduced, yes, that well maybe this I didn't mean, happen like that. Well, I mean, if you really think about how the court system is laid out, right? When you sue, part of your lawsuit is punitive damages, which means punish. It's a certain amount of money that's meant to punish somebody. Mm -hmm. He's dead. You're not punishing nobody. You're only going to punish his, his estate, family who inherited, right? who's, you know, potentially living off his uh, his music at this point. That's your punishing. You're not punishing Rick James. His kids weren't even born at that point. 1979, I think well, he had no kids. they're punishing his DNA. <laughs> That's what punish, they're, they're punishing his DNA. Mm -hmm. uh, but really, it's just a money grab from what I see. Sounds like it to me, too. Yep. Yep. Dwayne Wade has a son named Zion. Don't cut his dick off, bro. <laughs> so in, a, in an article in Time Magazine, uh, Dwayne said, when Zion was born, we thought the same thing. Let's give her a ball and see if she's into it. But ever since she was about three, we realized she wasn't. This summer, she told us she wanted to use she, her pronouns, and that she wanted to go by Zaya. Zion was now her dead name and should no longer be used. Uh, Zaya is 12 years old, by the way. This is just political correctness running amok. Like, this is some crazy bullshit. Like, how can a 12-year-old decide for themselves, rationally, who they want to be, what they want to be. Um, this is why there's all sorts of things put in place for children to not make decisions until they're old enough, till the front, till, till their frontal lobes are developed enough to make rational decisions. This is why they're not allowed to vote until a certain age. Um, you don't want them drinking and smoking and all kinds of shit at a certain age. You know, at 12, I wanted to be like Reggie Jackson or some fucking body. You mm, understand what I'm right. saying? Um, I didn't grow up to, 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 to want to be that, whatever I was thinking at 12 years old. Um, yeah, I mean, there's nothing that I wanted to do at 12 years old that I ended up doing as a full-blown adult. Nothing. Literally nothing. Like, 
<laughs> All my hopes and dreams at 12. Pretty much precipitated by 13. <laughs> Basically. Um... And I just want to say this. Now, this is not confirmed. This is a rumor and this is alleged. But they're saying that Zion slash Zaya's nanny is a male. They, that the Zaya, you know, she prefers to be called Zaya. I'll call Zaya. I'll call Zaya. Zaya I'm not going to say her it. or Zaya. I'm going to say him and I'm going to say Zion. The okay. name he, he was given. Because you can play all the fucking games you want, but at the end of the day, that's still a boy. Biologically. Boy. I don't give yeah. a fuck what you think you are. You are a boy. You're not yes. going to ever have a menstruation. You're never going to have natural estrogen. You're never going to have um, 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 eggs pass through your body. None of this shit. You can believe, you can like all the girl shit you want in the world, and that does not make you a girl. This is just facts. This is not trying to beat up on anybody or downplay them or hate on them. This is just real talk. Yeah. Allegedly, they've had a male nan nanny for, they're saying, 10 years or something like that. Who the fuck does that? Male, male nannies are very weird. Like, I've never even really heard of male nannies. I, I guess it's a thing they're called mannies. Um, and I don't know, maybe, I, I think probably in the gay community it might be might be more popular if you have like two two men who have a child so they mm -hmm. get a male nanny just to kind of... Yeah, keep it know, all... Mm -hmm. Keep the whole thing going, but confusing. Mm -hmm. uh, having a male nanny is is sort of weird. I'll be honest. Oh, it's super uh, weird. Women, ninety nine point nine nine percent of nannies are women. Uh, I, I I don't I don't know a lot of parents that would trust a man around their children, their small children for extended periods of time like that. I, I just don't know, just period. Not even relatives a lot of times, like uncles and cousins. Like most parents are like, nah, parents, grandparents, that's it. <laughs> Everyone else we're, we're a little bit leery of. To have a complete strange man to come into your home and be around your children 24 seven alone I don't know. Let me tell you something. I don't know. I have I have two children. Yes, two a boy and a girl. A boy and a girl, right? And I'm the oldest of three boys. Never in my life. And I love my brothers. I don't think they would ever do anything or no crazy shit like that. But never in my life did I send my kids, my children over there. Why, you know what I mean? Yo, go stay the night with Uncle Wise just by himself. Like, like, nah. He stayed, you know, my moms, my grandmom, shit like that. They can stay with them. You know what I mean? It, it's generally safer to keep children around women than men. Right. Now, one of my As brothers. As a whole. One of my brothers, you know, he had his, um, his wife, basically. And... So that's a woman there. So if they stay, you know, and then he got children and all of that. So you send your children over there. That's cool. Like, but I wouldn't have even come to my mind to my other brother who's not married and all of that. You know what I mean? Who's basically just single to send my little child over there to stay even one night with him like that. And yeah. this is my family member who I love, who I trust. You see what I'm saying? So now... Somebody outside of my family, I'm trusting my children with a male. Like, like, nah, that don't even. That just don't fly yeah. right. And part of the part of the danger is like, let's keep it real. Like, a man is a penetrator. You know what I mean? A man is the giver, and the woman is a receiver. Like, so, so the the risk of this man trying to penetrate, whether it's a boy or a girl would be much higher than a woman because she's not trying to penetrate anything. Like, you know what I mean? Right. Like and, and to be fair, I've interviewed a number of men that have been molested by their female babysitters. Yes. 
Um, DeRay Davis lost his virginity. Right, but uh, that was also at older ages. I'm talking about he, babies. He was like 13 or something like that, but um, Bill Duke was molested by a female babysitter right. when he was a child, when he was like eight or nine or something like right. that. I was six or seven years old, my sister and I, um, it was a babysitter we had that my parents trusted. And um, one day um, we were playing and we had fallen asleep with the babysitter. And we woke up to the babysitter touching us inappropriately, my genitalia, etc. And, and I'd never experienced anything like that. And neither did my sister. Uh, it happens, 100%. Right, 100%. So, so, so what, what would stop somebody getting molested by the male babysitter? Well, I think it's probably more common with males. Uh, when you look at child molesters in general, they're mostly men. I'm not proud of this fact, obviously, as being a man, but it, it is what it is. Our, you know, our side is, is more fucked up when it comes to that. Uh, so, I, I don't know. And once again, I'm going to say, I don't know whether this is true or not. This, this whole thing might be, uh, there's a video that was posted, but who knows whether it's a real video or there was just a friend of the family's one day, whatever. But if that's true, that kind of puts another piece in the puzzle. Right, and that's kind of crazy. Yeah, and honestly, like, at 12 years old, you're not even having sex yet. You still don't, you just don't know what you like yet. Right, even if you you're like still figuring girl, it out. Even if you like traditional girl shit, that doesn't mean you want to have sex with men. You see what I'm right. saying? Like, like, you just might like girly shit, but, but... What ends up happening with some of these dudes is since they like a lot of girl shit when they're younger, once they get into to puberty, since they like what girls like, girls like boys. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So they now start to like boys because they like everything else that girls like. You know what I mean? So that's just one of the other things that girls like. Um, now... What I liked was was a statement that I heard from, um, I think it was Young Thug, of all people, where he said, yep. God don't make no mistakes. Oh, man. Right. Like, but then, and he also said, you know, he said, God don't, make no mis God don't make mistakes, but hey, live your true self. He added that part, too. Right. But here's the thing, <laughs> you know, but hey, live your true self. Like, what the fuck does that mean? Your true self is who God made you to be. That's who your true self is. God don't right. make no mistakes. You were put here as a boy or a girl. Whether you believe in your mind that you're something else, whether you feel a certain way, could be manipulated by all sorts of outside forces, first of all, that you don't even realize um, again, we don't know what's in the formula. First of all, they call it a formula, Vlad. Like, think about it. Baby formula. So you don't know what's in the formula that can be um, inducing certain behaviors in certain children and not others. And there's all kinds of stuff. Um, the things you come in contact with, the people you're with. There's a lot of different shit that comes into play with all of this. Um... My thing, again, God don't make no mistakes. And this whole, this whole thing about evolution, okay? Now, this is a whole other subject, but that theory of evolution is what allows people to believe that God does make mistakes. Because the premise is God created things in an imperfect way still forming way that's getting better as time goes on. And so, yeah, he made imperfect things that are, that are, that are becoming perfect and, and, and turning into something better than it was originally. But that's all bullshit. That's all bullshit. One species does not change into a whole other species, but that's a whole other conversation. But 
That's where the premise of thinking that God makes mistakes comes from. Well, it's just interesting that Young Thug would make this comment who's a cross-dresser himself. Yes, well, that's what a lot of people say. And, and, and that's what kind of made it stronger, though. Right. <laughs> the fact that he said it <laughs> and where, where, where how people look at him sideways for the way he be dressing, but then he's like, yo, God, don't make no mistakes, was pretty, pretty profound in a way. Well, yeah, and if you really notice, Young Thug really doesn't do the whole dress thing anymore. I haven't seen it. Because, again, I think, uh, well, I, the shock in my was gone. Right. Well, the shock is gone, and I think ultimately, like Young Thug had like a number one album. His last album, so much fun, went went number one. And I, I, listen, I, I've never interviewed Young Thug before. He showed up in one of my interviews that uh, he did with his uh, girlfriend, but I wasn't doing the interview. But Young Thug, I think, was trying to get as much attention to him as possible in the early stages. You know, look, I got this music, and if I want people to check it out, I have to, I have to troll. I have to get a lot of attention to me. I have to make the news. Now you don't have and to. And some that. of that, some of that will spill over into people actually listening to the music and, and hopefully liking it. Now, Young Thug really can stand on his music. He doesn't have to stand on his an uh, antics. He doesn't have to stand on his beefs with anybody. He put out an album that was very well received. He was on, you know, he opened up for J. Cole on his big tour. Uh, he's considered one of the big artists of today. And suddenly he's not wearing dresses anymore and so right. forth. I don't think that's coincidental. I think he knows, you know, I did that, but it's not really what I'm about. And now that I'm actually could not, now that I don't have to do that, I'm not going to. But it also goes back to what I was talking about earlier. The soil didn't, didn't accept that skirt shit. <laughs> The soil didn't accept it. So he couldn't keep pushing that shit when the people, like, like if all of a sudden he saw mad people following what he was doing, then nobody he would have kept doing it. But nobody followed it. Nobody, nobody did it. Nobody wore dresses. Nobody, huh? nobody wore dresses that weren't already wearing dresses. Because the soil didn't accept. The soil rejected those seeds. We said we're not going to allow that to grow. So that's where power to the people comes in. Like we, the, the, the soil is the people, okay? So the people decide what flies and what don't fly. And we ain't fucking with this um, Zaya and all that. I'm not calling that motherfucker. That's the little boy, okay? Period. End of story. Well, Boosie chimed in and, and he went crazy. Don't cut your dick off. Don't was, cut his he dick was off, begging, bruh. Yeah, he was begging Dwayne Wade not to cut his son's <laughs> and dick I'm off. And I'm with him. Don't cut his dick off, bruh. Because just like he said, later on, he said when he turned 16, the boy might fuck around and fall in love with a girl. And now you don't cut his dick off. He made a mistake. He was confused. You know, hindsight is 2020. Okay? A lot of shit. How many, how many broads you thought you was going to be with for the rest of your life? Where, them, where that broad at now? Where's the girl you was in love with in junior high school? Where is she right now? Right. You thought you was going to be with her forever. This is true, yeah. I yeah, thought I right. was going to be with mine. She ain't nowhere around and I ain't thinking about her. Because I'm a grown oh, ass yeah. man. And I fucking been thought about, forgot about that little kid shit. <laughs> yeah. Niggas want to be Power Rangers and all kind of shit when they was kids. <laughs> I remember yeah, my I son mean... wanted to be a Power Ranger. You think he want to be a Power Ranger right now? <laughs> Come on, well, man. Uh, Boosie's comments got to the point where he was actually kicked out of Planet Fitness. That's funny. But and that, that's that only because funny. the manager there was gay or something. I don't believe that Planet Fitness has some sort of like across the board thing against Bootsy and his comments. He said that the manager that at the particular one he went to was gay right. and felt a type of way about his comments. I mean, <laughs> okay. shout out to Bootsy. Shout out to Bootsy. Shout out to Bootsy. I listen. Yep, I agree with him. Yep. Well, uh, another tragedy recently, Pop Smoke. Damn. Ah, man. You know, I, I had actually posted this uh, 
right afterwards. But me and Pop Smoke talked two days before. Wow. Now, we, we were not friends. We did not kick it. We never had an interview. But we've been talking about doing an interview for a couple of months. And every time I called him, we were on different coasts. And this particular time, he was in L.A. and I was in New York. And we were talking about doing it, like, next week. Because I was just going to say, fuck it and do it remotely and just not tell him. <laughs> like, you know, I was just going to pretend we're in the safe city because we've been doing this whole back and forth thing for months. And it was a very short phone call. I was like, oh, no, I can't do it, but let's do it next week. All right, cool. Yo, before I let you go, I'm like, yo, congrats on how you've leveled up over the last couple months. Like, yo, the music has really, like, expanded. And then you were on the Travis Scott Project, Jack Boys on I think the single from that, like you're, you're really doing it right now. He's like, yo man, thank you, thank you. And that was the last time that we spoke. Isn't that fucking eerie? Like when somebody passed and you're like, yo, I just seen him, like I just was talking to him yesterday type of shit. Like that's real eerie when it happens like that. Like, like, yeah. like nah, I mean, like imagine- I, cause for some people it's like, yo, I just, I just seen him an hour ago. What are you talking about? Like, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, I mean imagine like in that, well, let's just say that I had some sort of premonition and I'm like, hey, man, before I let you go, I just want to let you know that uh, you got two days left to live. So uh, make the most of it. Like, like, like imagine, imagine like the, the weight of really what's happening behind the scenes, the, the future that you just don't know about yet. He has no idea. Like he's living his best life. He just got an Airbnb in the Hollywood Hills. He got his friends with him. He got his jewelry on. He had just had a party. That's his house. Money. Right. He's got money. Uh, he just dropped his new album. Uh, there was rumors that him and Travis Scott were supposed to come out with a with a collab album together. Uh, he was really on his way up. He had really good management behind him. Like he had he had some heavy hitters behind him. Uh, and then boom, out of nowhere, it all ends. Twenty years old. 20. Not he cannot even legally drink. Hmm. And again, it's like, you know, what other genre of music, what other people does this happen to? Like, like this is come on, y'all. Like, come on, man. What the fuck? Like, who else does, does this type of shit happen to? Nobody. This is fucking embarrassing, yo. Like the shit that we do to each other. This is crazy. Like you could probably count on one hand how many people died in rock and roll under like violent circumstances. You know what I mean? They got more suicides over there. Like... Overdoses. I can't name of any. I, I cannot name one rock star that was killed during John the Lennon of their was career. killed. John Lennon John was Lennon. killed. John Lennon. Okay, okay, okay. There we go. That's a good one, and that's a huge one at that. Okay, John Lennon. But look John how Lennon. rare that was. You know what I mean? Like, like. Yeah, and and just to, just to make a point of it, although murder is murder, right? The premise of John Lennon's murder was someone that was just emotionally fucked up, was was completely off his rocker, and he thought he was John Lennon, and he needed to kill the fake John Lennon, and he signed John Lennon, like, you know, downstairs in the lobby of his building. Like, he, he was really, like, completely off his fucking meds. Well, make no else. mistake about it. We, as a people, are emotionally fucked up. Well... It's a little different than, like, for example, like an XXX Tentacion. Here's two people that killed him, or three people that killed him for money. It was a robbery. Right, but understand, we as a people are emotionally fucked up. The fact that we would kill somebody over money and this and that goes to our sickness. That speaks to our disease of why we would even do a lot of the shit that yeah, we okay. do. I see, I see where you're going with this, yeah. That's, that's, that's a good point. You're right. The, the fact that you would actually... Because here's the thing, when, when you're doing an armed robbery, you know you there's a good likelihood of you dying in that process. If that other person has a pistol, or if that someone around them has a pistol, you didn't see them, or a cop 
walks in on this, whatever else, you have a relatively good chance of dying in the course of that robbery. And if you don't die, you have a relatively good chance, a very high chance these days, of getting caught and doing a hellacious amount of time. So yeah, you have to really be fucked up in the head to do an armed robbery these days. But even, you know, I'm not even talking about armed robbery. I'm talking about taking people's lives just indiscriminately. Yeah. Like something is wrong. You're so Something is short-circuited somewhere, you know, in our brains so that we don't, you know, we don't have the compassion that we need to have for each other. We don't have the respect for life that we should have. Um, and it's crazy because that's not our nature. See, we're going against our nature by doing all of this, and we're making ourselves look like savages. We looking like savages is what we looking like, even though it's not our nature to be savages. We've well, been for short example, circuit. I had a, well, okay. So for example, I had Bosco 100 on my show recently. I just saw right? some of that. And he's a, you know, gang affiliated, uh, Queen Street uh, Bloods, and he had been in and out of prison his whole life. And, and we talked about a kind of a similar situation. And in his opinion, he said that he feels like blacks hate other blacks more than other races. He said in a gang situation, if a black gang messes with another black gang, they're quick to let off. Like they're quick to retaliate, drive by, whatever else. But if it's like a Mexican gang, they want to talk it out. Right. They first want to figure out whether they're a good solution. So he feels there's a level of like a self hate. Exactly. Type of That's what it is. But that was instilled in us. That's yeah. not natural. That's something that's been instilled over time and put into your DNA from the times of slavery. That's why all that shit is not over. Like all of this shit is residual. All of this shit yeah. that you're seeing now is residual trauma, residual um, dis-ease that exists within us as a whole, like not just individually. Like this is racial, a racial trauma that exists that we have to address. And, and and so you're quick to like, you're quick to dismiss, you know, oh, well, but the guy that killed, uh, what you would call it, was crazy. You know, he had something wrong with him. So do we. We must, or else we wouldn't yeah. be doing shit like, because this shit is crazy. This Excellent shit is point. crazy. Uh, Excellent point. I, I, I'm going to, I'm going to come off off my previous opinion and completely agree with you. You're right. People who are out there who say, okay, look, I'm going to go get my three friends and we're going to break into this guy's house in a coordinated attack. And, and maybe not even rob him. They're saying right. they what it, they're probably and, wasn't and rob even... and or kill him. One of the two. We're not quite sure which is which because LAPD really hasn't released any information. Well, we know what will. ended up happening. Whether there was a robbery or not, there was a murder that happened. And, you know, from what we understand, it was people that looked like him on the surveillance. Well, I don't know if that surveillance footage is real. I know what you're talking about. There's some surveillance video well, that's no, been floating I, well, around. From what I'm hearing, yeah, I heard about, I've, I don't know yeah. if I've seen all of that, but what I'm hearing... Uh, uh, and I don't think they're talking about that particular surveillance, even though that's going around. I'm hearing there was surveillance that the police saw, not that it was released or anything, but, you know, they're seeing, saying they seem some hooded individuals, you know, that look like black men, you know, going yeah. up in the joint. Well, whenever a tragedy occurs for the people that are still living, I always feel it's important to use it as a learning experience. That person is gone, but they leave behind clues for how to move. You could, to, you know, how you could move forward and how you could potentially not make the same mistakes. Right. So, what do we learn from this? What do you what think the lessons here were? Well, number one, and we don't know the details of this. 
But what we do know was that he was on social media. Speak on it. Actually showing his address of where he was at. He was showing some clothing he had, and it was like there was a shipping address that was to the location he was at. You could also see the number on his door. He was, and he had a party, and he was inviting a whole bunch of people. And I'm sure that some of those people were not people that he personally knew. They were friends of friends or someone who may or have just gotten broads, the address. You're just, trying to get some broads yeah. over there, and then they shared it with somebody else, you know. Yeah. Before depending. you know it, before you know it, there's people who may have a grudge against you or might just like, yo, look, this is a, this is an easy robbery here. We just go in. I, he got a bunch of jewelry on. We just seen him wearing it right. 30 minutes ago. It's probably at his house. He's not from it's, over here. So that's another thing. He's not thing from over thinking. here. He's not in a secure location. He is because the Hollywood Hills are not gated communities. Right. Okay. You could pull up to a Hollywood Hills house pretty much damn near any house, unless it's some huge mega mansion that has its own gate. But the hills are, they're so crammed, the houses are so crammed together that there's really no no gates or gated community. So mm -hmm. you could pull it, you could knock on someone's front door. Any, anyone who lives in the Hollywood Hills, you can knock on someone's front door. Right. Me, me and E-40, we were on the phone over the weekend, and we were just talking about how like, gated, like, like, so many like rappers just don't understand the importance of gated communities once you get to a certain level. Like where I live, you cannot get in if you don't have a driver's license. You could pull up and they say, I'm here to see Vlad. They'll call me and say, yeah, bring him in. And they'll say, okay, you know, sir or ma'am, can we see your driver's license? Oh, I forgot it. Can't come in. You're going to have to leave your car outside and Vlad's going to have to drive down and get you and bring you up. You're not going to drive your car in here if we don't know who you are. Right. And, and cause havoc with that, you know, use it as a getaway car or whatever the but hell But then that's is. just your crib. You see what I'm saying? What do you do that, that's when, just crib. when you're in another city or state, you know what I mean? And You stay in a, ho you stay in a hotel. Right. That you is a much more secure situation than a Airbnb. Which right. Is what but, is. but, listen, you know, people are very into, you know, flossing and, 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 having a good time, and guess what? You know, rappers and stuff, you know, we like to smoke weed and shit like that. A lot of times hotels got problems with some of the things that we want to do. You know what I mean? Um, yep. It's the you know, it might be too much but, noise. But, it might be right. too much weed, you know. And, you know, it might, be, it might be cheaper for me to Airbnb this mansion than to try to get the, you know, yeah. And it might it might not it might be more expensive to get the hotel and not as fly. You see what I'm saying? Like this is I might true. not even be this getting as much for my book, right? Right. So what now what do I want to do when I want to? Okay. I want to floss right. like that. I want I want right. I want to spend my money. I want to you know I want to live the fruits of my labor. What am I doing all of this for? This is what they're saying. I'm just being you know. Right. When is the last time you heard of somebody getting shot in a hotel? Shit, it happens, Vlad. It happens. I know it happens. When is the last time you've heard of anyone getting shot in a hotel? I don't know. I mean... People... Let's look. Look. People are crazy. People are reckless. Whatever else. But most people that go into some sort of crime will usually only do it when there is a reasonable expectation of getting away. Right? Right? You know you're not getting away in a hotel. You know there are cameras everywhere. In the lobby, in the hallways, in the elevator. There's a whole bunch of witnesses in the lobby. They're all going to testify. Nobody's going to have your back. No one cares about this, you know, stop snitching nonsense. Like, you are going to get caught. There's cameras outside the hotel and so forth. People will not do something knowing that 100% they're going to get caught. Unless they just really are completely fucking crazy or the hatred is set to such an extent where it just doesn't matter. Exactly. I don't care. And I'll, that, and that I'll go to prison. And, and that, that happens. happens. But it's an ultimate rarity because here we are. It's been what? Like a week and a half since Pop Smoke got killed? No witnesses. Uh, no story. They're not sure if it's a robbery or a hit. No information. There's cameras everywhere, but no one really knows anything. The family doesn't seem to know anything. Like, 
Yo, it's a completely different situation. All right, so so let me just uh, let me just put this out there. So I hear what you're saying about a hotel, right? But you got to think of people's mindset, right? So you're the type that would stay at a hotel. You're also the type that when you fly on a plane, what do you fly first class? Do you fly first class? Yeah. Yeah. But you don't you don't be renting private jets, do you? No. You see what I'm saying? Now, think about somebody that's used to uh, renting private jets who don't even want to fly commercial no more. You think this motherfucker want to stay at a hotel? That's like the equivalent of flying commercial. Most most people that, that unless fly the private, hotel stay, is stay so in hotels. sick, you see what I'm saying? Most, unless you have one of those people, hotels most that people are like that fly. No, I'm uh, uh, okay. I'm gonna have to disagree with you because I know people that do this. Most people that fly in hotels usually stay in private jets. In fact, at a certain financial level. Airbnb is kind of considered like like I don't I don't I can afford any type of Airbnb, but I want but it's to me Airbnb is to me more of like a right kind of some but, low, but, but, low but class Vlad, shit. You Vlad, know, right? It's a twenty year old kid who's just let, got money. Let me tell you about Airbnb. Okay, hold on. It's hold a twenty on. year old kid. You're talking about no, regular people. I know people that. No, with money. I know that. I know that. I know. So I'm just giving free game to everyone who's listening, right? right? I remember. I remember this one time, right? I said, man, I was living in New York. This is before we moved to L.A., right? I said, man, I'm getting sick of these fucking New York Februaries. I can't fucking do it anymore. We're going to go rent a fucking, like a cool little house in Hollywood. So we went on Airbnb and we found this dope spot. It was in the ho- it was in Hollywood, you know, right by the Hollywood Bowl, central location. The place looked dope. You know, a couple of upstairs, downstairs, a cool little front yard area. I'm like, you know, the price was cool. I said, yo, this is the shit. Yo, I'm all over this. We rented that place for a month. We got there. Let me tell you how long the stairs was to get to this fucking place. There's this, you're, you're damn near hiking for like 15 minutes to get up to this damn house. Okay. It's some shit like if you forget something in the car, you're not going to go back and get it. And that's usually what these Airbnbs are like. These are all places that people don't want to live in themselves. You know, they're, well, they're not that not great. Not all of them, it's though. Like, when you get to a certain level, Vlad, I feel like there's, I think there's a higher level of Airbnb that, like, no, no, the average is, person might not there be is privy that, to. Right, but, but, but you know in a hotel, you know if you stay at the Four Seasons, you know what you're getting. You know the type of room. You know the type of service. Right, and, There's and, no and question what I'm saying mark. is they might not have something big enough for what you want. Like, like you know what I mean? Like, like. All right, I, f- I feel you. Listen, I feel you. Listen, rest in peace. Uh, I, I understand that he was having a great time. He was living his life. He's 20 years old. He's doing his thing. And I just want to leave one more, one more thing before I, I get off this topic. Because, you know, we talked about this before, how words become things. Yes. And, you know, vocalizing things into the universe becomes objects. Yes. I got to listen to Pop Smoke's second album, you know, after his death. Right, and he did that many and men. That, that. He had that, but the first song on the album, the title of the song is Invincible. Mm. And, and that just sort of shook me up. I'm like, Fuck. Well, see, no, to me, that would be speaking strength, though. To have a song called Invincible, that's speaking, that's speaking positivity in the universe. To have a song like To Redo Many Men Wish Death Upon Me, that's the well, one that would that, be there's more the one, chilling. There's that, too. Because there's that's that too, the one but... that ended up manifesting. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. When you put out yeah. songs like Invincible and, and Undefeated, that's to try to strengthen your... Your, your resolve and your spirit. You see what I'm saying? Like, but when you talk about these other songs, the way Tupac would constantly talk about uh, uh, and, uh, to embrace an early death and, and all of this shit he kept saying it, he kept saying it about dying early, that's the type of shit where you vocalize and, and, and put shit into the universe and make it manifest. But I don't feel like a title like Invincible is saying that. I, I feel, you know, it turned out he wasn't invincible, but I don't think a song like that is putting that shit into the air. To me, it's songs like Many Men. <laughs> Those are songs that 
you know, yeah, that that could bring shit on you, you know. Well, like well, like 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 think about Biggie, ready to die. Yeah, you see, no, like I feel those you. are not good. Those are not good titles, yo. Well, the reality is that nobody's invincible. We're all flesh and blood. There is someone or something that will prove us wrong when we feel like we are invincible. Uh, Kobe Bryant seemed larger than life. And that did not save him in that situation. Saying you're invincible, like, to me, and definitely that money don't like, save you in that in these situations. No, like no, having no. all this money will not and, stop uh, none of that. Uh, you know, it's like you know, I'm looking at the the chorus and the song "Invincible." I, uh, there's a hundred dudes in the spot, and I'm walking through them. Uh, like, I, I I feel I feel where he's coming from. Like, yo, listen, I'm 20. I'm making money. Uh, you know, I, I'm repping my gang, and I got all these dudes that are fucking with me. I got security. I got this, and yet no one could touch me. I'm untouchable. Takashi Six Nine brought down the whole Nine Trey Bloods. The whole crew was brought down by one guy cooperating on to the highest level. He he spoke on everyone. Uh, this dude Nuke recently got sentenced to 17 years. Who's part of that crew? Um, and we've had lots of interviews where it's like, yo, had he not told, they probably, I mean, they would have gotten time, but much less. I just interviewed Kevin Childs, who was one of the, the Harlem uh, drug kingpins. And they arrested something like 20-some people around him. And no one said nothing except one guy. <laughs> one guy that started telling as soon as the handcuffs were on. And he was the reason why he ended up getting 17 years. One guy. One guy. Right. That's usually how it works. Then you got to ask him, why didn't the other 19 guys not say nothing? Because shit well, was a little most different times, back then. Huh? Shit was different back then. And people realize at that level that, look, if you get a whole bunch of people together and no one says anything, the, the feds have a very hard time proving that in trial. And they have such a high conviction rate that they don't want to... They have such a high conviction rate, not because they keep winning in trial every time. It's because everyone pleads out. You know, we're offering, you know, you, you might face life, but take this 10 years. Right? Remember, do you hear the story about those bikers? It was a big bike brawl that happened where like nine people ended up dead. 170 people were arrested. Nobody cooperated. Wait, was it all like the Hells Angels and... Yeah. The Hells Angels and a bunch of other like motorcycle clubs. They all brawled. Nine people dead. Tons of people injured. Right. No one said nothing. 170 charge. 170 people had their charges dropped. That's how it works in the feds. If you really want to get away with this shit, no one say nothing. That's how you really get away with it. But one person turning will fuck up the whole operation. Yeah. And, and the likelihood of that one person turning is high because the fear factor is so high. The shit that they yeah. threaten you with is so scary. You know what I mean? They just got to see. Somebody going to break. You know what I mean? Like, somebody going to break. Somebody's going to break. Yeah. And uh, while uh, Anthony Gonzalez was locked up, Pusha T drops the song Snitch. And although that wasn't exactly about him, there was parts in, in that story, that in that song, that were kind of about him. Mm. And he was saying how the, he, that became very dangerous for him in prison at that point. And so, so as I'm listening to the song, um, it got like each verse or whatever, and each verse that come out, I can tell that the song is not about me because it's saying um, your baby mama or something at the club, um, you call and you're asking about such and such. I'm saying like, well, don't none of that, don't like, none of that about me. But then you get to the last part of the song and it say, we built this legacy. And I'm like, well, hold on now. <laughs> Ain't nobody built this legacy but, <laughs> but me. <laughs> so I'm like, okay. So I said, all right, I get it. So now, now I'm putting my manager, I'm putting my manager head on now and saying, oh, I get it. It's so much stuff surrounding 
you know, people snitching, people doing this, people doing that. And, and him being an artist, he got to say that. He got to try to play the card of, of hey, you know, I don't got nothing to do with this, just in case you hear about this. So it was well played because he's very smart. Well played. Um, so I didn't even call him back then. So um, the Virginia guys call a meeting. I'm the center of the meeting. So when I get in this meeting, the, the guys tell me, hey, man, like, what's going on? Why do put you out there like this? So I'm trying to tell them, no, nah, no, nah, it ain't about me. It ain't about me. It's only this last part. <laughs> the guys get mad and they're like, yo, nah, bro. They say, we understand that you're saying that this part is about this person, this part is about this person. They said, but the only person that people know is you. So to us, the whole song is about you. That's all people go, go say that's who the song is about. And they was mad because they like, you know he put you in harm's way, right? Because now they mad because you can have other people now looking at it like, oh, you, you, uh, the Virginia guys are hibernating the rat. Whoa. Yeah, because he kind of had a crew of Virginia guys that were sort of fucking with him and kind of protecting him. And then when that song came out, everyone's like, oh, y'all protecting a snitch? And it, you see what I'm saying? It created a, a level of, of danger in that prison yard because you're not supposed to have snitches in your crew. Like it's, it's one of those things. And did he, you know, but he did it to save his family and the other guys were, you know, the people were telling against him. And it's, it's a very, very, very complicated situation on a lot of different levels. I mean, I'm sure it's always complicated though. Like let's make no mistake yeah. about it. I think right. every person who ends up having to cooperate you know it's, it's it's complicated they didn't they didn't go into it thinking that they was a snitch you see what i'm saying and ultimately somehow they came out of it being a snitch or with, or with this label like like you know fortunately you know you and i are not in this world or whatever we don't we don't have to deal with that i don't have to worry yeah. about snitching on nobody because i don't have nothing to right. snitch on like like that shit is so you know the same way you stop fucking with bmf i just stopped fucking with sh just street shit you know what i mean all together at one point i said you know i'm gonna get me yeah. a job fuck <laughs> this like motherfuckers yeah. is getting locked up around me i'm surprised i didn't get locked up i i dodged the bullet let me go get a fucking job because I'm going to be a rapper. I know that. I'm going to be a oh, rapper. Yeah. yeah, and and people always like, oh, aren't you worried about all the gangsters you interview and all the all the shit that you talk, you know, the, you talk about money sometimes or whatever else. Aren't you worried about the IRS? And it's like, no, I pay my taxes. I don't do any crimes. I interview right. people about their crimes. I don't get involved with these people on a criminal level on any at any point at all. So whoever wants to look at me or whatever aren't gonna find nothing. Right. At all. Look all you want. I I, I run a completely legitimate business. I follow the rules and uh that's why I have the flexibility to do what it is that I do. I don't have to look over my shoulder. Well see, and it takes a certain amount of discipline to do that. You got some people that would come in contact with these people and be so enamored with the lifestyle that they might wanna like, hey, you know, can I get into, you know, if I give you a couple thousand, could you flip something for, you see what I'm saying? Like, like, yeah. they'd be very tempted to do that and just to feel like, yeah, yeah I, I, I'm, you know, I'm doing drug deals with this famous drug dealer or whatever the fucking case may be. And now, you know. Yeah, uh, Buju Bantan just got out of prison not too long ago from do, doing exactly that. Here he was a Grammy-winning reggae artist. That does bands all conscious the world. music. Like, like, does conscious that's music. That's what was so, like, hold up, Buju, <laughs> cocaine? Like, this doesn't make sense. Like, 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 Buju is so profound and so righteous. Like, but once you hear the story, you know. 
Shit happens. Like, shit is complicated, like you said sometimes. Like, you know. Yeah, I remember talking to one of the Marleys about the Buju situation. Because I guess Buju used to hang out with them a lot. He was actually with them, I guess, the day before the arrest. Wow. And uh, and I'm like, yo, like, I, I, don't, I don't get it. What, what's going on? He goes, well, he goes... Buju had a lot of anti-gay lyrics. Um, boom, bye-bye, everybody boy dead. And in the environment of that time, more and more uh, like countries and, and venues were just kind of banning him altogether. Right. So his money was not what it was back before when he was at his height. So he was trying to kind of maintain that lifestyle. Uh, you hear the story a lot. Shaheem, who you just hung out with recently, uh, in our interview, he said that that was the cause of a lot of his problems, is that he did not want to be Shaheem the rapper in the Honda Accord. He he had to pull up in a Benz. He had to have some jewelry on because people would clown him. He can't get a job. He's, man, what happened to you? Weren't you just doing videos Listen, that's, with that's, that's, the, that's for a lot of people. A lot of people. That's, that's a yeah. thing. How do you that's maintain... After all of that shit is over, how do you still project that? Like, without fully swallowing your pride. Some people have to really, either you swallow your shit crazy, or you're going to try to do some shit to keep the illusion going. Look at look yeah. at Steady B and, and Cool C and them dudes. <sighs> they was the first yeah. ones to suffer from that. They oh, was yeah. the first ones to be... <clears throat> In videos with big ass rope chains, and when all that shit was over, they wanted to keep it going. So what do we do? Let's go to the to the buildings that have money in them. Let's go rob banks. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that turned into yeah. a whole fiasco. Yeah, it turned into a murder because the the security guard got murdered, and then everyone involved in that situation. I think a police officer got murdered. If I'm not mistaken. maybe police officer. Yeah, yeah, I think police, police officer, officer got murdered, and it didn't matter who pulled the trigger at that point. Whoever was involved in that criminal uh, all situation are all being charged with murder equally. Uh, so they're still in prison. To this all all day. three of them are still in prison to this day. To this day. To We're this trying day. to maintain a certain. Appearance and image. Yeah. Yeah, man. Uh, messed up. Uh, messed up. Uh, I'm going to try to say this without laughing because I really, this is, <laughs> this is, this has really been killing me over the last like day or so. Okay. So, uh, I'm already laughing while I'm saying it. So in LA, someone stole a hearse, right? And it had a body in it or some it shit? It still had a body in it. So apparently a guy... Was you know was driving the hearse with like a woman, a dead woman in the back, in, her, in the coffin. He had stopped by to drop off some flowers and left the keys in the ignition. Twenty-five-year-old James Juarez decided to jump in the car and drive off with the car with the body still in it. <laughs> the L.A. County Sheriff went on Twitter and said, out of all the bad decisions you have made, <laughs> at least make one good one and bring back the deceased person and okay. cask it inside the navigator. Uh, there was ultimately a high-speed chase on the freeway where the car crashed and, you know, the guy was arrested. <laughs> I mean, that's just some impulse shit. Like, like, you know he didn't wake up that morning so, like, you know what, I'm gonna steal me a fucking hearse today. Like, you know what I mean? Like, he just saw a, a vehicle running. It, people are, um, you know, creatures of opportunity. People are opportunists. Yeah. You see an opportunity and you just fucking want to jump on it and shit. He just saw the shit was in the ignition, is running. He didn't even think that there was a body in the back. You know what I mean? Right. It, was, it was a navigator. It wasn't like a, a traditional hearse. It was, oh, it was a well, navigator, see? like a stretch navigator. But okay. All right, cool. Hey, look, a running car. I just hit a lick. Great, I'm gonna jump in, I'm gonna drive off. At some point, you look in the back seat. <laughs> well, do you? Do you? Right away? Like you're in a navigator. What's gonna make Yo. <laughs> What's gonna make me think that there's a fucking hearse? I mean a, 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 a coffin back there. Like if you just turn around at all, you will this is not a pocketbook that someone left in your car, Jamar. I feel like it's just this is like it should smell weird in there too. <laughs> right. It should smell right. weird in there. Like like you know that funeral home smell? Like like uh yeah, for for formaldehyde. It or should whatever just have a funny smell at the very least. 
what the fuck? Oh, shit. Like, like at what point? And, and he saw that, and he said, fuck it. I, I'm still going to go. I'm going to keep driving this until they finally caught him. Why would you just not pull over and say, fuck this, I'm out? You know, like, for example, like, like you know, you hear stories about, like, someone will, 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 will steal, you know, you have, like, bad parents who will leave their kids in the back seat and, and run into the gas station to pay or whatever. Why someone does anybody the, leave their keys in the ignition for any amount period. of time? Like, yeah, I, I yeah, don't I do you. shit like that. Yeah. Like, I don't. I, I don't either. I'm going to run in the either. store with my car still. Who the fuck does that in the first place? Like, no, Growing I, up in I, New I used York, to talk, uh, no, I remember I interviewed uh, I interviewed Glock Nine, and he used to say how he, that's how he used to steal cars. He used to just hang out at the gas station. Someone would run in real quick. He'd jump in the car, and boom, he got it. I mean, I've, I've never broken into a car before. Do you break the window? Do you put in like a, a coat hanger? Like how, how do you how do you get it open? First of all, shit, you leave your shit running at the store. I'm gonna jump in at. Oh, there. so you're not even trying to break in. You're just. Oh, someone, someone's at the yeah. at the gas station running real quick to, to pay. Mm-hmm. Gonna jump right in. <laughs> <laughs> they come out and their shit is missing. Mm-hmm. See, growing up in New York, I feel like you become very distrustful of people, like, because this is the capital of where people try to get over on you and, and just do shit like that. Like, like, I feel like that's an outside of New York thing where people leave their car running and and run into stores real quick, and you know what I mean? Because yeah. I heard some yeah. shit. Yeah, but what, what, what I was going to say is, though, like, you hear stories that, like, yeah, someone will run in real quick, and they have, like, a kid in the back. Someone yeah. will you know, jump in the car, grab the car, and drive off with the car, and then a block later, they realize there's a baby in the back, and, and they just jump out. Like, okay, fuck this. You know, I could do three years for Grand Theft Auto. I'm not going to do 25 years right. for kidnapping. child kidnapping. <laughs> You know, so you have this body in the back and you decide to just keep going with it. Like, and imagine the news. We're starting to inform everyone the funeral will not happen today. <laughs> Someone stole Aunt Maria. <laughs> We're trying to get her back. <laughs> Please be patient with us. Please be patient, but oh, hopefully man. Maria will be returned. <laughs> Oh, man. Yeah, that's crazy right there. Uh, uh, only, and you know, you talk about stupid. Uh, there's also another story we posted where a girl who was babysitting her nephew, her 10-year-old nephew, decided to take a selfie with a loaded gun, ended up accidentally shooting the nephew. Dead? No. Uh, he had to go into surgery. He barely survived. And she was cooperating with the police. She basically just said it just like that. I was taking a selfie with a gun. I didn't realize it was loaded. It went off and shot her nephew. Mm-mm-mm. That's crazy. Yeah. That's crazy. Yep. How much, Let's how see much, another news. How much murder another has news? the internet caused? Like, how much... Oh, yeah. Like, well, well I, think, I think Instagram, man, like... Me personally, I used to, I used to post myself on Instagram. I would take a, you know, when I'd interview someone, I'd take a picture with them, right afterwards. And then I just started noticing, like, okay, well, I wore these shoes, I wore this outfit, so I guess I gotta have a different outfit because people are going right. And you can't possibly right? have a different outfit forever. Yeah. So you end up having to shop more because you're shopping for the gram in a way. So at one point, I just said, man, fuck all this. I'm, I'm just gonna stop taking pictures, like. I just don't give a shit about this. Uh, and it actually made my life better, I feel, just not being on the gram like that. We still use Instagram because it's a excellent, you know, marketing tool for what we do. You know, we get a lot of clicks. We get a lot of visitors, whatever else. So we post up our videos. We post up news every day. But I just don't post myself up anymore. Right. Every so often. Every a couple times a year, maybe. And... Yeah, like you sitting there trying to be gangster <laughs> on Instagram, you end up almost murdering. It's just your like nephew. a lot of things happen. That's what I'm saying. Like a lot of things happen just for trying to impress people on the gram. Like people yeah. have, like at the very least, you know, you might be on 
Instagram, you're taking a photo and like, you know, but you're doing it on some precarious and then the chair falls out from under you and you fucking, <laughs> you know, dislocate your shoulder or some shit like that, mm -hmm. you know, at the very least. Um, but then you got shit like this, like where the little kid got shot by homegirl trying to floss with the gun on the gram. Even when we bring it back to Pop Smoke and all that, he put the picture... The, the, the bags up on the gram that inadvertently had the address that led yeah. to, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. like and, right, and I forgot to really mention that during, during this part of our talk, but that also, I think, is a very important lesson that we have to learn from the Pop Smoke situation is stop posting your private life on the internet. Stop posting where you live Stop posting your car with the driver's license plate visible. Like, you know, and I, I'm like, I remember um, there was some fake news that was circulating about me. Um, and we talked about this, how like there, there was a fake meme about how the judge personally thanked me for convicting. Uh, right. ARF. He was like, see? Right. Uh. Yeah. Absolutely false. Absolutely false. It's not true. The judge did not say anything to that regard. Uh, like. I had nothing to do with uh, AR Apps conviction at all. Uh, I'm, I'm extremely sad that it happened. But I remember this one guy like DM me and was like, yeah, you're dead next time you're in New York. And so I, I, I go to his Instagram and here he is posing next to his car. Like, yeah, this is my new car. License plate right there. I was I was so angry. I'm like, you know something? I, I'm, I'm going to just go to the police and just report this motherfucker. You know what I mean? Because it's like, yo, what what if he's actually serious? Like, what if he's actually wants to kill me over this fake news? And you know, I, I you know, and then I'm like, I talked to a friend of mine. They're like, yo, you're gonna ruin his life potentially over something he's probably not even serious about. You know, he's just mad. He's seeing some fake news. He's mad, and you're gonna give this guy a, a potential felony and put him through the system and potentially ruin his life when really there's. There's probably not a credible threat to yours. So I said, fuck it. I'm not going to do Trust nothing. Me, but can, here he can... is with his fucking driver, with his license plate. Like, yo, like, there he is. And what do you like, look breaking like? The... He look like a dickhead? Because because when you actually <laughs> see a lot of these motherfuckers <laughs> that be talking shit in your DMs. He look like a, he look like like a dickhead. that's him? Yeah, he absolutely. Like, oh, my he absolutely God. Like... Like a dick, absolutely look like a dickhead. But, yo, like, you've not, you know. You, you've been to my house. Well, you've been to my last house, mm -hmm. but you've been to my house. The fact that you've been to my house means that you and I really are friends. No one else that you know has really been to my house. Like, it's not, you've never seen my house on Instagram. You've never seen my car on Instagram, like the outside. Maybe if I'm just live streaming inside my car. But you've never seen my car, my license plate. You've never seen my family. You've never seen none of that shit. It's all private. I don't invite people to my house. Unless I'm extremely close to them. I don't have parties at my house. None of that shit. You have to be careful. And I don't know the Pop Smoke situation, but he was he was kind of careless with his with his location and his security and and you know, he's living life and wants to, you know, wants to celebrate, but yo, you have to be careful about this shit because it's going to the whole world. Here's a tip that I would give. I like this is something that I like to do. <clears throat> Like, I know a lot of people who like to, like, they want to update you up to the minute of what they're doing. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Especially with that story and all that type of shit, right? Yeah. First of all, a lot of times I forget to even pull my fucking phone out when I'm doing some shit, right? But when I do, I'm like, you know what? I'm going to post this shit when I get home. Right. I don't right. have That's to post it right this fucking second, yo. So now niggas know. Because the location's still going to be there from where you took the picture at. You understand? When you go to post it, it's going to know where you was at and all of that type. Where this picture Or, or you there. just don't have to post your location. You can leave right. it off. But even still, but a lot of you don't have to post the location and still people could see from, right. you know, oh, he's at that. I know what that club looks like. He's at that club. Let's go over there right now. You Let's see what I'm saying? Right like, now. like, yeah. like. Post your shit the next day. Why are you so hot to fucking share your shit immediately? You know what I mean? So that way you could have did all of that shit, videoed it, posted it, but then by the next day, by the time you post it, you long gone. You not even, you know what I mean? You know where to be Let me found. put it like this. Let me put it like this and we're going to, we're going to, I'm going to uh, get off the topic. To 
everyone out there, to all the young people out there, you are missing out on experiencing some of the best times in your life because instead of actually experiencing experiencing that beautiful moment, you're in the phone. You're trying to record it. And you don't even have very many followers at that. So the 13 people that like that shit, you've missed out on the actual opportunity to actually live in that moment and have an incredible memory as opposed to recording it. Because the memories are way better than a fucking picture. Memories, well, you can't have the full experience if you're if you got a damn camera out. Right, memories you know? have have taste, touch, smell associated to them. Pictures are just the visual. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like like you don't really you know you take a picture of your fucking meal that you went to this fancy fucking restaurant. Like, does it really show? You know. Can you remember the taste and the smell of it? Like that's what really makes it great, not just how it looks. And it's like, but you you yeah. can't even enjoy what you're doing because you're so worried about trying to, you know what I mean? Let everybody else see what the fuck you're doing and shit that right. you're not right. even and enjoying. You want them to enjoy what you're doing, but you're not enjoying what you're doing. Yeah, I mean, look, the way we met was out in Amsterdam. Right? Remember? Living life. Back in 2004 yeah. or something? Before like you, all of this yeah. social before media. Before all this shit. Before Vlad TV, actually. When I was just DJ Vlad. And you guys... Maybe MySpace being, existed at that time? MySpace, I think, existed. Okay. Yeah, I think it did. But you guys were performing in a club, and I was already recording shit back then. And I pretty much recorded the whole concert from, from the bottom, you know, from the foot of the, the stage because I was on my recording shit back then. And I could tell you that I didn't really enjoy that concert very much because I was recording the whole time. Right. My best concert experiences are when I'm just rocking out and, you know, seeing Cypress Hill, being at the Insane of the Brain video shoot at the DNA Lounge in San Francisco and rocking out with everyone and crowd surfing. And you don't have to worry. Are shit. they still in frame? Is the music No, I'm clipping? not holding anything. Right. Seeing Karis one perform. Seeing Red Man and Method Man tear down the stage, you know, in, in San Francisco, uh, being in Oakland and seeing Too Short. Like, these are priceless experiences that I was not holding a camera that all I have is the memory, but the memory was so much better without recording it, you know? So stop recording shit, stop living and start living life. Boom. I like that. The actor that plays Paperboy on Atlanta is going to be Marvel's first gay superhero. Well, I'm not familiar with Atlanta like I should be, I guess. I never really watched it like that. Um, but I heard this news. Um, uh, I'll, I'll show you who it is. Using just so, us just to so pioneer a lot about. of this gay stuff, but okay. This is him. Yeah. I saw the, I saw his picture. Yeah. You never watched Atlanta? Not really, no. Good show. I mean, he pretty much plays like kind of the rapper slash kind of gangster drug dealer. Like, you know, he's he's like a like an up and coming rapper, but he's still like in the streets and he'll still like smack the shit out you and Right. So they took plays kind of a they took kind of a that, tough guy character. They took that image and now they're gonna turn him into a gay superhero. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Apparently there's a kiss. But yeah. yet people act like there's no agenda. Like like Batwoman is now gay, yes. Really? Yep. Batwoman is gay. Bat well, is it Batwoman or Batgirl? There's there's a Batwoman and there's a super girl. Yes. Um Batwoman, look it up. Batwoman is gay. Well, the actress who's playing her no, is gay? No, her character. Her that woman gay. Oh. is gay. <laughs> okay, so this is a TV show. Yes. I think it's one of okay. those PIX11 type joints, maybe? Uh, CW. CW, okay, yeah. And yeah, so the character is, you know, has I guess is married to a woman or some shit like that. I never watched it, but I heard about it. Um, 
Why? <laughs> Why well, like? Ruby, well, Ruby Rose. Okay, okay. So is this Ruby Rose? Ruby Rose, who mm-hmm. is, I believe, gay in real life. You know, she was in Orange is the New Black. Okay. Uh, is playing Batwoman. Okay, okay. So that that's that's who's on the show on the D uh, on the on the CW show. It's Ruby Rose. Very 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 pretty. Very pretty girl, uh, who's gay in real life. Okay, she could I be believe. gay in real life, but that don't mean the Batwoman has to be the character. Gay. Uh, well, there you go. So you got you already got gay superheroes. It's just like it's just overkill to me. Like, come on, this one's gay, that one's gay. Like, come on, like. But we say that they're not trying to like force feed this on us. Like, but it absolutely this is what's happening. Like, you know. It's just a little crazy. And it's just funny how they really use black people to be at the forefront of it. You know what I mean? Like, you'll have white people that are gay here and there, but they're really using us, the Billy Prestons and all these type of motherfuckers. Like, now they're going to have him every year at the Academy Awards with a new he-she dress on. Like, you know what I mean? Like, 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 like if you think about it, the shit with uh, Bruce Jenner, you know, that died out kind of quick. Like, like... He did what he did, never cut his dick off. Um, and you don't hear about him that much anymore. Like, But whenever they always trying to promote a lot of this new alternative lifestyle, they love to use black people as the spokespeople for this shit. And it's because we shape a lot of culture. A lot of people follow our lead. So now when they need us to influence people, that's when they fucking, you know what I mean? Once they don't need us no more, they're going to throw black people to the back of that bus, too. (laughs) I I, I remember when I interviewed uh, Godfrey and we talked about playing gay roles. And he brought up an interesting point. He goes, well, why would you approach him for a gay role when there's so many talented gay artists, you know, uh, actors who could probably do a much better job of that? More uh, authentic. I don't. I don't know. You know the the actor who plays Paperboy, uh, Brian Tyree Henry. Um, I'm not sure if he's gay or straight. I have no idea. Uh, I didn't really get. It didn't seem like he was gay based on the show and his, some of his other roles that I saw. You absolutely have no idea. But it's a hell of a carrot to dangle in front of uh, an actor who really is not a list by any stretch of the imagination yet. It's like yo. You could be a Marvel superhero. Right. Not only is it a nice check, but you're going to be able to eat forever off this. Like all the comic cons and all the, you know, all these conventions that happen. You might have a lunchbox after you. You might have an action figure. Yeah, yeah, you might have an action figure. Like, yo, like Michael Jai White, he still goes to conventions because he was Spawn. Right. That was like, what, 30-something years ago? (laughs) Like... And I'm sure like, he could still be, go there. He could go there for Black Dynamite too. For Black Dynamite, he could do a lot of shit. But like the comic shit has a very cult following. And to say, okay, look, we're gonna dangle this in front of you. Forever money. All you gotta do is kiss a man and be an openly gay character and stuff like that. Right. And so uh, keep in mind it's forever I money think, and it's forever image, too, though. It's forever image. It's what goes with and, it. And uh I think most actors, whether they admit it or not, would probably do the same thing he did. Because to be an actor and to get into a major film like that, that is such a huge hurdle to cross. That most actors would do it. Now, you wouldn't do it. Michael Jai White wouldn't do it. Uh, All my friends wouldn't do it. But I think most actors, period, would. Probably. I mean, most actors that don't have any type of stance on anything, you know, if you don't stand for anything, you'll fall for anything. You know what I mean? If you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. So, um, yeah, they probably would, you know. Um, I just know that there's no amount of money. Like, that amount of money is nothing in comparison to what they're going to get out of the imagery. You know what I mean? The imagery 
is gonna is gonna last so far past that money after you spend it. You know what I mean? Um, and even if you get money for life off of this shit, like the type of you know, I want to say damage <laughs> that you could do to some people's psyche is 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 just not worth it to me. Well, yeah, I, I remember. I forgot who what which interview this was, but we had talked about Denzel Washington, and he had told this person that at the end of the day, your career as an actor will be more defined by the roles you do not take rather than the roles that you do take. Mm. Speak on and it. Denzel, Denzel has gone down as someone that I think has stuck to his principles, that has never worn a dress. Um, he's never really, uh, I don't think he's had any on-camera on relationships with white women because of his own... Uh, his, his own beliefs mm -hmm. in that regard. Uh, he's never uh, played a punk. He's never, uh, you know, really veered off something that you, you're like, oh, why did he take that role? Like, oh man, like, uh, that, that, that's a bad look. You know, like, like for example, Richard Pryor had a pretty good acting career, but then there's movies like The Toy. Right. Where he played Literally basically a slave for a little for a, kid. For, yeah. yeah, basically a slave for a little rich white kid. Yeah, that's going to be included in the conversation of of his career forever, unfortunately, because hell, he had a drug problem. He was burning through money crazy. He was willing to take whatever role they were giving him as long as the check was good. Right. So. Although he is going to go down as one of the great stand-up comedians, he's absolutely not going down as one of the great actors. Whereas Eddie Murphy is going to go down as one of the great actors. Hmm. Think so? I think the great so. actors? I think so. I think so. In fact, he is the greatest stand-up comedian slash actor ever. He's had good movies. Um, he's had great. He has had great movies. Coming right. to America was great. But when you start, huh? Boomerang. Boomerang was right. great. Hold up, hold up. But when you start talking about actor, right? In order for a comedic actor to really be taken seriously, you know, they got to come with that real serious role. I think. I think the one where he showed. Um, Dream Some Girls? Serious acting props was Dream Girls. Yeah. Dream Girls. Well, I mean, okay, look. There, there's also Jamie That's the Fox one where he that. where he strayed the most from yeah. Eddie no, Murphy. I gotcha. You see what I'm saying? I gotcha. Everything gotcha. else is comedic acting. So no, I gotcha. It's a well, little different. Well, I mean, I mean, you can't forget about Jamie Foxx, who was a stand-up comedian as well, and then went and got an Oscar for Ray. Right. Uh I mean, clearly, I mean, you could say that. Jamie Foxx is a better actor than uh, uh, than Eddie Murphy, but once again, Jamie Foxx had a bunch of roles that were kind of like, uh, I don't know why you took that. This was not the best role for you. Like, you well, see, like, that's what I'm saying. But just because his his choices might not have been good as picking projects, yeah. that doesn't mean he's not not as good of an actor as Eddie. He uh, could still be know. a better think, actor, and but just make bad choices. You see, because I think Jamie probably is the better actor as far yep. as acting is concerned. I feel uh, Eddie is the funnier comedian and the better comedic actor, but I don't think Eddie could have ever did a Ray type of, you know what I mean, where he Eddie, embodied Eddie, yeah, someone Eddie else. Doesn't have the like range. he just tried to do Dolomite, yeah. and it was Eddie Murphy being Dolomite-ish. He didn't embody Rudy Ray Moore to me. Okay, I see what you're saying. Yeah, when I when I watch Dolomite, I'm always seeing Eddie Murphy. I still see when, Eddie when, Murphy. When, yeah, when I watch Ray... He was Ray. I, I, I'm, I'm seeing Ray Charles. Exactly. I'm forgetting, I'm forgetting that that's Jamie Foxx who and that's played the uh, Ugly Girl Wanda and all, all types of... And that's of, the that difference. Yeah. 
Okay, I'll give you that. I'll give you that. That's how we're going to end it. Lord Jamar, always a pleasure. Uh, let's not forget to remind people, April 5th. April 5th. Sony April Hall. April 5th at Sony Hall in New York City. DJ Vlad, Lord Jamar, live. We will have some fuck are you talking about moments, <laughs> I'm sure. Because this guy be saying things that make a motherfucker say, fuck are you talking about? Fuck are you talking about? Yeah, so I look forward to that. That's how it is. There's, going, there's a link down below for you to click and buy tickets. Yes, sir. Uh, you know, hope to see all y'all there. No doubt. Peace. Peace.